Hello, 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 and welcome to another coordinating call, DM25, the movement for Europe, featuring progressive ideas you won't hear anywhere else. I'm Meron Kalili. You would have had to have been living a very isolated life recently to have not heard about Squid Game. It's a Korean drama series that's become a global phenomenon. It came out five weeks ago or so, and it's already Netflix's biggest show of all time. 142 million viewers across 90 countries. It's dominated conversation in social media. So clearly it's struck a nerve. And what's it about? The dark side of capitalism. The series is an allegory for the modern capitalist society. It tells a story of uh, desperately indebted men and women and competing in deadly games for millions of euros in cash, while society's elites who are behind the games uh, face little repercussion or no repercussion for their actions. So are we living in a real life squid game? And if so, how can we vote to end it? These are the questions that our panel will be discussing today. You out there, this is live. So if you've got any thoughts, ideas, comments, concerns, rants, anything you want to throw at us, please put it in the YouTube chat and we'll put it to our panel. Let's kick it off with Lucas. Thanks, madam. Um, so yeah, it's another piece of content about Squid Game. And why, why is it that it's such a phenomenon? Why is it that everybody's talking about Squid Game? Why is it that we, DM25, are talking about Squid Game as well? Well, there's several reasons. I, I think, first of all, it's it's a show that's about a dystopia, but it's not set in some faraway planet, some faraway future or alternate present like most dystopias are. It's about our society as it is. And of course, as far as we know, the 1% are not literally organizing that game just yet. But for example, just last summer, Jeff Bezos uh, went to space and then when he came back, uh, he gave a press conference and then he had the call to say something to the effect of, I want to thank Amazon workers for this because you guys paid for all of it. So uh, basically, you know, thanking his workers for slaving away in horrible conditions and having to be in bottles so that he can entertain himself with his little rockets. Uh, so it's a capitalism that's so brazen, that's so unafraid of real challenges that they're comfortable saying what used to go unsaid. Um, and to exemplify how some people are living in a completely different planet, uh, I actually saw this online and I want to share with you three quotes from business leaders on LinkedIn regarding Squid Game. The first one, uh, the one culture value we love the most out of Squid Game is equal opportunity. And that's what my company has always stood for. The second one, this article neatly explores some of the show's PR and marketing lessons that any brand can jump on. And then the third one, is investing in Squid Game two investing lessons learned? So this is just to show how wide the gap in worldview between the wealthy and the most of us has become. It's not just a wealth gap, but it's a gap in just uh, the way you perceive everything. Um, but to me, the most interesting aspect, uh, having watched the show, is that the players, the, the participants in the game, at one point, of course, they get to vote to end it. Very early on, uh, as soon as they realize what horrible thing that they have actually signed up for, um, they bring up that clause in the contract that they sign, and then they vote to end the game. Uh, they do that and then they go back to the real world. But then, of course, very quickly they come back once they realize how, once they remember how hopeless their lives were outside in the real world as well. Uh, and then they decide that uh, regardless of the cruelty of the game that they signed up for, there's actually not much of a difference. And in fact, it's even, uh, it, it's a little bit more hopeful in the sense that there's more of a chance of you winning the lottery and then earning the financial security that all of them uh, desperately need. And I think that also resonates uh, with me and with a lot of people because it's, again, it's not so different from the world that we live in, you know, where democracy is, uh, the meaning of democracy in so many places is just basically mainstream parties that cater to the same interests with different colors and different brandings and different people and slightly different messages. But essentially, you know, they, they answer to the same people. And more and more people seem to be attracted to radical alternatives, just anything that might offer an, an exit from the current state of things, no matter where in the spectrum it might be. And I think 
it's crucial for us to be able to channel that energy into something that's truly progressive um, and that can move us beyond capitalism in solidarity and not in, in hatred. Um, so how do we vote to end the game for real? Well, I think DM happens to believe that such a thing is possible. That's why we have electoral wings. And in fact, we have some very exciting news on that front. And I'm going to let our German members perhaps uh, talk about that a bit later on. But uh, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. You, you said it all there, really. Um, I should have introduced you, by the way. It's Lucas Fabraro, a new face around here, uh, our new communications coordinator. Um, next up, Maya Pelovic. Go. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I because I don't have social media, I actually uh, didn't know about this uh, Squid Game uh, hype. Uh, so then when I realized that there is a, a new show that I must see and it's the Squid Game, I have been binging it for a couple of days now. I've watched the, I think, uh, all maybe two, I have only two episodes left. Uh, and I was really, because uh, this is a topic that I'm interested in also in my work, the topic of uh, surveillance and uh, of uh, playing games and the way that uh, democracy in our everyday life makes us play games that we're not aware of. Uh, and I don't want to talk about the, uh, like the dramaturgical aspects of it. I was really... Uh, very surprised that uh, so many people are watching a show that we have seen before, I think for dozens of times in lots of other shows, uh, starting from uh, The Hunger Games, that was a recent uh, movie that had the, I could say, the completely the same uh, 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 topics uh, involved. And also, of course, all the movies which we've seen from uh, the Truman Show uh, to today. Uh, but the thing I realized, uh, because of course I was watching all the YouTube clips of all the people criticizing the show, I was uh, mostly uh, wanted to see what the hype uh, was about because it was like a big, big uh, critic of capitalism. Like, you know, all of us now realize the, uh, what our worst enemy is. And I think that it's too... Uh, plain, basic, and simple in this show. Uh, and I remembered one movie. Uh, it, it's a movie from 1969 by Sidney Pollock uh, called uh, They Kill Horses, Don't They? I don't know if uh, some of the people watch the movie, but uh, it, it's a movie based on uh, a famous book by Horace McCoy from 1935. Uh, that is actually uh, very similar uh, to, the, to the Squid Game, uh, but it actually happened uh, in America during the Great Depression. Uh, there were uh, marathon uh, dances. It was called like the dance marathon that happened during the Great Depression. And actually people were really dancing in this uh, big like spaces uh, where people were watching them. Uh, they were dancing to death. There were people that were really ill. There were people that killed uh, killed themselves uh, after these dance games. They had to dance for hours, days and weeks. They also slept there. And if somebody would uh, Google dance marathons, they could even see clips uh, about it. And this movie is like, uh, it's like an actual documentary of, of uh, the whole thing that happened during the, uh, during the Great Depression in America. And when they asked people uh, why they participated in this game, they uh, said that this was the only way that they could get uh, shelter food and a place to sleep at the moment. So most of the people did not enter the game just because of the prize, but because they uh, could not survive somewhere else outside. Uh, so uh, probably the, um, I was thinking why this show is popular now is that we are in a way entering a, a new kind of great depression with of course the pandemia, with all the things happening to us, uh, with the surveillance that uh, has been more obvious in the last uh, two years. And maybe that's uh, the main reason of the popularity uh, of this show. Uh, and also one thing that people are not talking about, and I think it's an important aspect of, of 
the Squid Game is that this is a show from uh, from uh, South Korea. Actually, we're uh, mostly used to seeing these kinds of uh, shows, movies, and series uh, in the West, uh, not so much uh, in uh, places like South Korea. And South Korea, of course, if we see it uh, like a, a place uh, that was uh, uh, divided from the North after the Korean War, we can also see the whole issue of the North and South actually on the Korean Peninsula and also having one of the people in the show, uh, actually maybe even the wisest one being from North Korea. Uh, the, one of the girls that actually is involved in the Squid Game is from North Korea. And uh, when uh, they asked her uh, uh, why she came into the game, she said, well, I thought it would be better inside. And I think that it's also, we should also think that uh, maybe if we, look at the world uh you know after the cold war divided into the two and forgetting that uh of course not talking about the north korea in a positive sense but all the positive things that uh we have still in north korea like uh uh the, like basic income like uh, uh the uh, public health care system uh and people that are the fetters from the uh, north to the south which we have in the Squid Game, they are entering a, a kind of place uh, that uh, is not so democratic as we think. Uh, and uh, we have uh, the whole equality thing that, uh, uh, that Lucas mentioned. Uh, and of course, uh, the whole uh, uh, thing with the game is that all the people there are equal, which is really completely paradoxical because they're not equal, of course. And uh, of course, looking at the whole uh, uh, democratic South as a place that uh, in a way resembles also some kind of a concentration camp where we have, you know, the, the players going inside, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the ovens at the end, uh, but into some kind of packages. Uh, so I think this is a, a very good uh, example, how a show that is maybe something that we've seen before can uh, enter some topics that we can talk about uh, in the future. Thank you. Maya, um, I should warn our audience that if they haven't seen Squid Game, there'll be plenty of spoilers in it for them <laughs> watching this. Um, Dushan, Dushan Payevich. Okay, uh, thanks, Mekhan. And I'm not going to lie, I'm not amazed by Squid Game. I think, as Maya said, that it is a mix of already seen TV shows and movies like, uh, I don't know, Circle, Would You Rather, uh, Hunger Games, Platform, and so on and so on. But I liked two stuff uh, from there. The first one, uh, Lucas briefly mentioned, uh, it teaches us that two options, choosing between the two options is not a democracy. And this is what working in capitalism is. Would you rather work for Amazon and be in the bottle, like Lucas said, or would you rather starve and die? Uh, this is the question that they are presenting to us, that it is a democracy, that it is fair and square, but it is not. We need universal basic dividend and we need to participate in the question, not just choose between the two options. Uh, one other thing that I like is, uh, well, as you know, I'm animal liberationist, so I have to mention this. I think it uh, portrays in a perfect way animal agriculture because for for example, two, two reasons for that is that uh, the people there are provided with number tags instead of names. This is just a way for us, for them to be completely depersonalized and without a real character. Uh, they use the same for animals in the industrial agriculture. They have uh, number tags instead of names. And also they use uh, the world eliminate instead of murder just like we slaughter animals in animal agriculture, or even uh, the farmers sometimes use the word harvest. So euphemisms will not save us. It's still the same thing at the end of the day. Thank you, Dushan. A comment from uh, Andreas Zimkus on the chat. One could argue that Squid Game promotes a position against elections as a mechanism for change. The participants vote for change, but living conditions remain the same and force people to return to the game. Interesting take. Who wants to comment on that or anything else they've heard so far? Who wants to go next? 
Everyone thinking, digesting. Nope. Srechko, can I put you on the spot? I think this is your wheelhouse. Go for it. Yes, you can. I'm sorry if my connection is a bit bad. I'm on a on a on a boat, <laughs> on a ferry. So I hope it will it, it will survive. So I watched, of course, uh, the Squid Game. I mean, I'm I'm a passionate, uh, serious watcher. So I watched it parallelly to to the other two uh, series, which I think are also worth uh, mentioning. Uh, the other one is White Lotus. Uh, because it shows this decadence of the of of the one percent, uh, and it's also very funny. Uh, and the other one is the chair, which which shows the decadence of the current academia. And it's interesting that these shows are now being shown either on Netflix or on other pl platforms, and that precisely these shows are becoming uh, very popular. Because what is in common to all these shows is that they show a certain critique of capitalism. Uh, but unlike many other critics uh, or, or uh, people who have watched these shows, um, I think actually it's very interesting to, to, to discuss their subversive potential. You know, whether these kind of uh, uh, products of popular culture are subversive or aren't subversive. And watching Squid Game, I mean, it's impossible not to remember Mark Fisher uh, who, similar to David Graeber, died too early. I mean, people usually die too early, except a few. Uh, and who coined the phrase of capitalist realism? Uh, you know, this idea that, uh, which is also, of course, influenced by this famous saying, which has been repeated so many times by Frederick Jameson, uh, that it's that it's uh, uh, impossible to imagine that it's po that it's possible to imagine the end of the world, but it's impossible to, to imagine the end of capitalism. Uh, you know, this kind of feeling that, uh, which you have in Squid Game, that it's impossible to get out of capitalism. And as someone, I think it was uh, 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 Lucas at the beginning already said, you know, even when the players of Squid Game get out of the game, uh, they're actually still inside of the game of capitalism, uh, which in a way might be even more cruel than the Squid Game itself, because the Squid Game at least is very explicit in what will happen to them. Uh, so I think in that sense, uh, uh, it, I think it's popular partially precisely because it's part of this capitalist realism. Uh, and this is my biggest problem with, with the series, uh, uh, my biggest problem with dystopia these days. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of dystopia. Uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago in Croatian language, I published a book on dystopian movies, uh, but I think the problem with current dystopia and generally with dystopia today, although dystopia, of course, offers a critique of our current society and doesn't show a society in the future, but actually criticizes the current political economy, uh, social conditions and so on. Uh, but the problem is that I think what we miss is actually utopian thinking. So instead of uh, imagining uh, the end of the world, I think we have to start imagining the end of capitalism. Uh, and in that sense, I think Squid Game still gives us uh, two important directions. I would say one is the topic of debt, uh, uh, definitely, where in the, in, the, in the series, I think it all resolves around the topic of debt. And uh, I think it shows that uh, the majority of people in the world today are highly indebted. Uh, whether it is the students with student loans in the United States or it is uh, people who don't have social housing anymore and have to take a loan and so on. Uh, and it also shows a new sort of morality, which again is nothing new. Friedrich Nietzsche already in the gen genealogy of morality uh, uh, showed that uh, uh, the etymology of debt uh, is connected to guilt because Schuld and Schulden in German language means guilt and debt. So those who are indebted they're guilty as such. And then Maurizio Lazzarato, a great philosopher, goes into the, into the production of the indebted man, showing that everyone today becomes a kind of self-entrepreneur, you know. We are all ourselves responsible, uh, even for our healthcare system, for our careers, for our education, and so on. And in order to get healthcare, education, or housing today, of course, you have to, you have to get indebted. So I think definitely the topic of debt, which again would bring us back to David Graeber in a way, is an important one. I think it's important that we have it in popular culture. culture. And the other one, uh, I think it's not by coincidence that both in White Lotus and in Squid Game, uh, you have references to critical theory, uh, which I find very interesting. So for instance, in, in White Lotus, of course, you have uh, Franz Fanon, you have Judith, Judith Butler, uh, not Judith, that's our Judith, but Judith Butler, uh, 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 the pronunciation, uh, and uh, you have Jacques Lacan. 
And then if you watch Squid Game, you again, at, I think in the first or second episode, besides uh, René Magritte, uh, the, the, the famous painter, you also have Jacques Lacan. Uh, and what does this say? I think it's not a pure coincidence. I think what uh, uh, both White Lotus and Squid Game show is the importance of what in French theory would uh, be called uh, libidinal economy. You know, an economy which is based on desire, an economy which is based on the production of desire, an economy which is based uh, on uh, uh, the production of the unconscious. And uh, what it shows is actually, I think that uh, in, in both series is that this libidinal economy was captured by capitalist realism. Uh, so instead, instead of desiring a system which is out of capitalism, most of the prot protagonists, both in White Lotus, you know, the proletariat who works there in the hotel, shitty jobs, bullshit jobs, as Graeber would say, for the 1%, they also actually want to become the 1% in a way, to start their own business, to earn money and so on. And in Squid Game, all of them actually want to become rich. So uh, in that sense, I think we have a serious problem with our current libidinal, libidinal economy. And to conclude, I think, uh, uh, it's a big task for a movement such as DM25 uh, uh, to, to also, and that's why I'm really happy to have this uh, conversation today, to start speaking about the libidinal economy, not just political economy, but an economy which is based on desire, on the unconscious, and in which way we, the progressives, uh, the Democrats, the subversives could capture or even produce a sort of libidinal economy which would get out of the capitalist realism. And I think that's our big task today in popular culture, we don't have many products uh, which are actually showing in that direction. Uh, so in that sense, I think to conclude Squid Game kind of remains in the trap of capitalist realism, not showing really any kind of concrete, progressive, utopian desire, you know? And I think that's the biggest problem. And it's our responsibility to create, recreate a sort of utopian desire today, even in popular culture. I think people here, Yanis or whoever, Maya, for instance, should do Netflix series uh, because that's definitely a way to, to, to reach people and also to produce utopian desires. Or maybe a Netflix series of another now. Couldn't be a bad idea. <laughs> anyway, thank you for that contribution, Svechko. Uh, lots of very important points, especially about the subversive potential of this. I mean, will, will, this, will Squid Game prompt people people to take action is it possible today that that a, a series like this could drive people to actually do something about it or will it just be another kind of uh, social media drive-by explosion and this time next week we're all binging on something else uh judith you did forgive me thank you um, I think there's uh, another problem. I mean, apart from this uh, series not showing us anything other than capitalism, uh, there is also uh, the problem that uh, the whole series, um, as we're watching now, comes embedded in one of these platforms which have taken over from our current uh, version of uh, capitalism, uh, what Janis uh, sometimes uh, calls uh, techno-feudalism. Uh, and uh, that is a real problem with the consumption of a series uh, like uh, this one, because uh, in Korea, when you watch it uh, in, on Korean TV, uh, it is a lot more subversive than the version presented on Netflix. Uh, so uh, Netflix uses its uh, power uh, of uh, influencing what we are seeing uh, in the English speaking world uh, by editing out references uh, to, for example, the treatment of Pakistani immigrants, editing out uh, references to the commons, uh, to uh, com uh, communal ownership. Uh, all of this is suddenly missing in the subtitles. And uh, uh, some are saying that uh, the, um, the English subtitles provided by Netflix are actually worse than what a volunteer could do. So um, it really seems intentional that they cannot find any professional translators who are better than volunteers. And this is a problem with Squid Game. It's also a problem with um, pretty much all of their foreign content if you're watching it uh, with subtitles. And the problem is that uh, with this kind of uh, platform capitalism, we cannot actually go elsewhere. And uh, like with a lot of uh, previous uh, series, I, I tend to binge on Chinese series, not Korean ones. Uh, I used to watch them with uh, volunteer translations and uh, they were really good. Uh, but uh, with Squid Game, you cannot actually watch them elsewhere to have a better translation. So you're forced to consume this uh, series in the way that Netflix wants you to. And that means consuming Netflix uh, worldview and not uh, what is actually presented in this uh, series. Great point. Thanks, Judith. Juliana, Zita. Um, thank you. Um, 
a great comment from uh, Judith uh, because it fits to what I wanted to say. And I think that's really crucial to point out that the bigger picture here, which is for me Netflix, and to see that, I mean, Netflix is not like usual Hollywood production. I mean, Hollywood is like a network of people and creative people searching money and producers who will take their, their scripts and make a movie or series out of it. But Netflix doesn't function like this. Netflix has much more data on us, for example, than any no, usual Hollywood production would have. They know just how many people went into the cinema and how many people watched it on TV. But Netflix knows what we watched, when we watched it, when we stopped to watch it, when we, you know, when we lost interest in something. And, and of course they use all this data. If you look at the content of Netflix, almost everything is much more t tending into a, a negative world, into problems. You know, it's the, this, it's the same thing that Facebook figured out on us. If content is negative, we click on it. We just can't help ourselves. It's just, it's like watching a car accident where people cannot stop looking at it. And it's, it's the same mechanism. So this is why I, I want to emphasize that it's not just about creative people making a series about the world and analogy to capitalism. This is also true. And of course we can also benefit kind of of that. But I think it's more important to point out that they, they just know what, what we are watching and we, what we want to watch. And they will always produce what they know that people will click on. So I think it's important um, to, to criticize Netflix also uh, because it's a closed system. You cannot just submit a, a script to Netflix. They just work with people they know. It's, complete, it's a completely closed circle of people who have 210 million subscribers which, uh, like Judith said, um, they can completely um, kind of, you know, tell the people what to watch and what to think. And I mean, subconsciously, on the long term, it works. Thanks, Juliana. Good point there in terms of surveillance capitalism and Netflix's uh, business model. Uh, Squid Game to date has made $900 million for Netflix, which is over 42 times its original cost meanwhile the director who's based and writer who based the story on his uh, own personal experiences according to a piece in the guardian was only very modestly paid um okay ivana uh, thanks uh, I, I really like this discussion although i haven't seen any of the episodes of uh, squid game because i'm trying to boycott netflix uh, because of the reasons juliana outlined so I, I would like to go from the other perspective and uh, why is this question, which is not new, everybody said that this, is, this team is not new. I remember, because I can, a Running Man with Schwarzenegger from 1987, which had the same topic. And I think that this kind of question, uh, polarity of choices, as Dushan said, democracy is not only uh, choosing between two options, is something that the industry is imposing to uh, the audience, to watchers, to us, that can relate to this and ask ourselves, which one would I choose? Would I stay a beggar or would I sell my soul uh, to become rich? Why are these scenes so brutal and so... Uh, obnoxious for people to watch. I think it's because we need to be kicked in the stomach to have a reaction because we are numb, because we don't feel anymore. We, we cannot relate to, to uh, more unindustrial things, you know, something that is not so much coming from the capitalism. Uh, and Again, we are talking about a series that is just sensationalism. It's something that it's either or, it's either creative industry, not art anymore. Uh, and this creative industry is also meant to produce uh, capital, not to be a mirror to a society that art should be. Thanks, Ivana. Maya. 
Uh, I just wanted to uh, add one short uh, short comment. Uh, as Rechko was saying that uh, maybe this is a time uh, to think about utopias and not dystopias. Uh, I'm actually a big fan of dystopias, but I think he's completely right. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, with the Squid Game, uh, we have a, a big problem uh, with the ending. Uh, Maren uh, already said, uh, spoiler alert, uh, not to watch this uh, uh, until the end of the, the series. Uh, and that is, uh, of course, which we know from the beginning, that they, there will be one player at the end uh, who will win and get this uh, enormous uh, amount of money. Uh, and of course, they, they they all want it. And at the end, we have the, the final player that gets the money. Uh, and uh, he actually uh, wants to change the system. But the problem is that in this uh, uh, utopia, in a way, uh, we see a dystopia because he is changing the system himself, number one, with money, number two. So that's the actual problem with the message at the end of, of the Squid Game, that we have uh, uh, somebody uh, that is supposed to be, as the main character, uh, a good character, that at the end is trying to destroy this game of capitalism, but uh, he is trying to destroy uh, the game uh, in a sense of using... Uh, using the methods of capitalism, not killing the game itself, because of course, uh, killing or destroying this game cannot be done by one person. And I think that that's uh, very important. So. Thank you, Maya. A comment from the chat from Christian Vieira. When big entertainment shows injustice, it isn't to bring awareness, but just to exploit what's already happening by grassroots movements in rekindling popular uprisings. It's just a way to release catharsis. Yanis Varoufakis. Thanks, Maren. Uh, well, 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 I am going to be in a minority of one. I don't think it has anything to do with capitalism. There's no capitalism in the squid game. The Squid Game could be um, is, is closer, if you want, to their own arena. It's um, absolutely uh, consistent with uh, uh, a slave-owning democracy, a democracy um, regime, or uh, feudalism. Indeed, it is very feudal, and this is where where I uh, resonate with uh, what you did was saying before. It's closer to what I consider to be a new phase in uh, the development of capitalism, but it's not capitalism. Because remember, I mean, firstly, this idea that you've got the capitalists or, you know, the rich who are bored and who make people do stuff um, in order to be entertained. Mm -hmm. So the assumption there is that the money, the, the wealth, the power is independent of the game. It's already been decided um, it's already been produced. Um, there are the haves. For, for some reason, which is unexplained, it's not endogenous to the game. It's not part of the game. The game has not decided who the rich are. The rich are pre-existing. No explanation of where the wealth comes from. So there's no theory in the squid game of um, wealth creation. It's only a question of um, what do the rich do with their power when they're bored and how do they make the poor do things for their entertainment? You know, that's the Roman Empire. It's not capitalism. There's not a smidgen of capitalism in the squid game. Um, that's my first assertion. The second assertion is that, uh, um, or comment, uh, it, it's quite right to say that, um, you know, when you give people, um, a stark choice between one thing and the other. That is, of course, not democracy. Uh, it was never meant to be democracy. Uh, you know, I will make an offer you can't refuse, is uh, the strategy of the mafia. Now, of course, that is a, also found in capitalism in the sense that the reason why workers accept conditions of exploitation is because they have no access to the means of production. But in the squid game, there is no production. There is only distribution of existing um, wealth, which is not explained within the system. Now, um, many of you have mentioned many kinds, very, many varieties 
of this kind of feudal or Roman arena entertainment, whether it was a reality show, whether it was um, The Running Man, or whether it was, um, yeah, things like, uh, who remembers that great movie of the 1970s, Rollerball? Do you remember Rollerball? Okay. Um, again, uh, there is an element of truth in the sense that um, the an exploitative uh, oppressive regime uh, requires bread and circuses. Uh, you need, to, in order to keep people pacified, to throw them some bread so they're not starving and some circuses to entertain them. And in a sense, the squid game is part of the, the, the circuses of a capitalism, which nevertheless is not reflected in the squid game. Um, Having said that, and this is where I will pick up the thread from Judith, uh, as you, many of you know, I have this, this weird uh, theory that I'm working on, that um, capitalism has already morphed into a variety of feudalism. Uh, so in that sense, <laughs> uh, maybe the squid game becomes more pertinent because capitalism is killing itself is evolving out of capitalism. But I will insist, and this is how I'm going to close, in saying that um, um, it is a huge analytical error to try to find capitalism in the squid game, not consistent with the structure of the squid game, capitalism that is, or vice versa. Um, and finally, such close, you know, you know, realistic utopias is what I uh, trade in these days. Um, this is exactly why I wrote another now, because, uh, you know, I, I, I really enjoy dystopias, but uh, we have a moral duty to answer the question, especially by younger generations, of how could things be different? Because that, that was David Graeber's greatest line ever, that th everything would be different, <laughs> a very revolutionary line. Uh, but then you have to answer the question is, how could things be different? This is why I wrote another now. One last point. If you really want, and you know that, you, 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 I'm sure you've heard me say this, but I feel the need to repeat it. If you want a genuine analogy of capitalism in a dystopic depiction that comes from the arts, from the movies, from Hollywood in particular, it is the matrix. It is not anything related to the squid game or any of these silly games. And why the matrix? Because in the matrix, the whole of humanity, the whole of hum humanity become uh, objects of exploitation by the machines that humanity has discovered, has invented. We all become, uh, in the end, servants of capital in the matrix. That is a genuine analogy for capitalism. Because remember, Marx was not talking about, you know, the, the bad rich who are sitting in a room uh, well, you know, or bored, and they, they they make the poor do things for them. No, 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 no. In das Kapital, and that why, that's why I'm a Marxist, and what, that's why I think Marx was so such a such a, such a liberal, um, a, a radical liberal thinker, is because he's capturing the alienation not only of the worker but also the alienation of the capitalist. And the fear of the capitalist is that he's going to, going to become bankrupt. Um, the, the rich in the squid game don't have any such worries. They will never go on the other side. Um, but in the matrix, all humans in the end are reduced to becoming um, electricity generators for the machines that they've created. In the end, the machinery that we have created, whether these are robots or steam engines or diesel engines uh, or um, uh, conveyor belts, right? In the end, instead of them serving our interests as humanity, we end up serving the interests of capital accumulation. That's why I vote for the matrix if you want an, 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 an allegory for capitalism. Thanks, Yanis. Beral, Beral Madra. Thank you. Uh, I would like to look to this film uh, from the point of view of uh, society of spectacle. Uh, 
I just read uh, many paragraphs of Guy Debord's uh, Society of Spectacle, and most of the paragraphs are really describing what this film really means for the uh, global society. I think we should, uh, if, for example, uh, somebody writes a critical text about it, they will use probably a uh, quote, probably uh, Guy Debord during, uh, in this text. But what made me, uh, I mean, what I didn't find uh, ethical is that they use a child's game, which is global. I mean, every country have this child's game and they really polluted the, this child's game. I think this was really uh, disturbing for me. Uh, uh, making an innocent child's game uh, at the end, the message is if, if you lose, you die. I mean, for example, if a children, uh, a child uh, uh, accidentally sees this film, can you imagine what happens in, in her or his uh, imagination? Uh, so this was uh, disturbing for me and I really appreciate uh, all the critical approaches of uh, you. Uh, I think uh, it was very uh, good that we discussed this film. Thank you. Thank you, Burrell. Um, a question from the chat. If we say that lives which are made of the time in which we're alive are priceless, how can we have wages, hourly or otherwise? This is getting very philosophical. Um, Svechko. Yeah, that's, that's a bit too philosophical for me, but <laughs> I'm joking. That, that's a question for Yanis, I guess. Uh, but I'd love to pick up on something what uh, Maya said. Uh, and, you know, this is this basic uh, thesis that uh, you cannot dismantle the master's house by the master's tools. Uh, you know, that uh, you cannot change the system you're trying to change by the very means of that system. That's one thesis. Uh, uh, you've seen probably what happened today. Uh, in the so-called semiosphere, uh, in the internet sphere, when uh, no Novara Media from UK uh, was completely shut down from YouTube, without, as far as I know, in the last hours, without any kind of uh, 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 explanation from the side of, of YouTube why that exactly happened. Uh, so one of the leading alternative media in the UK just gets shut down, uh, and it doesn't exist on YouTube anymore. <laughs> Now it's back in the meantime, but you know, what, what does it say? You know, it basically goes back to this thesis that you cannot dismantle the master's house by the master's tools. Uh, and I must spoil it immediately. I don't really believe that this thesis is necessarily correct. Uh, of course, if we analyze this situation, our situation here, so all of us here for this meeting, we are using Zoom, uh, then it's live streamed on YouTube. Uh, so basically, we are all using platform capitalism in order to criticize platform capitalism. Uh, uh, but I am the one, as Yanis would know, that's the place where we met at the Subversive Festival in Zagreb, uh, who still believes in subversion, you know, that you can actually, and we must, we have the responsibility to use uh, the existing tools uh, in order to dismantle the master's house. Uh, how successful we can be in that, that's another question. Uh, how much will they co-opt us? That's also a very important question. Uh, but I think there is no escape from it. You know, if you go back to the Squid Game, what would have happened uh, if the main player who, spoiler, but it's obviously obvious from the very beginning of the, of the very series, uh, uh, that one player would end up there in the end, only one. You know, what would have happened if he decided not to take the money? Uh, I think he can make a bigger mess by taking the money and ruining their game or ruining their show. And I think that's a lesson, you know, how can we, I don't have a given answer, but how can we actually be subversive today uh, by using the tools as we are using now, Zoom, YouTube, Twitter, where we announce our Zooms and YouTubes and so on. We are basically using all the tools by Silicon Valley, uh, uh, whom we try to bring down uh, and, you know, nationalize, not necessarily nationalize, but to actually uh, uh, turn technology into a commons, uh, you know, and that's a big question, how, how can we actually, if we still rely on these tools, uh, or in the end, you have this kind of 
uh, uh, VIPs, uh, uh, like similar to the Squid Game, uh, who then just make fun out of us, or they make fun of uh, Captain Kirk, for instance, or William Shatner, to be more precise. Uh, you probably saw this scene when William Shatner comes back from space. Uh, he's saying, you know, what kind of revelation he had. And Jeff is, you know, opening a bottle of champagne, not even listening to, to him, because for him, uh, this is just a cooptation both of Star Trek and all the energy and utopian energy of Star Trek, uh, and just publicity for his company. So, in a way, it shows our reality is much more dire, much more dystopian, I would say, uh, than the Squid Game itself. Thank you, Srichko. And, and there's a very lively discussion in the Zoom chat about recommended viewing on some of the topics that we're uh, discussing today. So David is putting them in the YouTube chat to share with everyone. Any other comments? Johannes, Johannes Fair, go on. Thank you. Um, I haven't watched Squid Game um, and I'm probably not going to because uh, as some of uh, you have already mentioned, we are working on some utopias at DM25. Um, there, there's a European utopia called the Green New Deal for Europe. Um, and as Lucas mentioned in the very beginning, we are uh, working towards an um, event on 13th of November to present our utopia for Germany. Um, it's a program that DMS are currently vo voting on. So if you're a DMR or if you want to join the movement, then do this and you can vote on our um, utopia, our vision. Um, it's called uh, For Vision and Responsibility, um, our program for DiEM25 in Germany. We are also voting on, on the name of our lecture wing, uh, our lecture wings everywhere, actually, uh, as well as uh, for Germany. And um, I wanted to mention that uh, if you are free to travel to Berlin on 13th of November, or if you're living there, uh, please come. Um, get a ticket um, and in general uh, yeah join us and um, let's try to build this utopias together and then um, definitely make sure that we are not living in a squid game um, thanks very masterful johannes nice <laughs> any other comments thoughts we've discussed a lot of we've approached this from Many different angles. I think there's been a, a lot mentioned. Yanis thinks Squid Game has nothing to do with capitalism. Uh, we've had do this very Judiths, forgive me, very important intervention about um, Netflix dubious translation, which is communicating Netflix's worldview, infiltrating our brains. Any other comments? Or should we wrap it up? We're at the top of the hour. That was a fascinating discussion, everybody. Okay, well, there we go. We'll, we'll leave it with Johannes's uh, note on the forthcoming German party. Thank you very much for you guys uh, watching and for your comments. And let me just remind you very quickly that our campaign accelerator program is now open for applications. That's our, our grassroots activism incubator program where we'll work with you to build a campaign to address issues in your community. The deadline will be end of Saturday, October 30th. So please apply to that at dm25.org ca. And we will see you at the same time. <laughs>